1915, France has withstood the first shock waves of war. In Paris, the life of the boulevards, the life of the cafes, the theaters, the sumptuous markets, all that seemed threatened is thriving again. The German threat, which reached to within 25 miles of Paris the summer before, has now receded into stalemate on the ground and mild danger from the air. The stalemate will be broken. The army chief, Joseph Joffre, insists on it. Ponderous, resolute, he plans an all-out offensive, unaware of an impending new shock. It is one that France will feel for generations. It will turn a French town into history's cruelest battleground, a town called Verdun. It is December 1915. Kaiser Wilhelm's German army is preparing to strike at France, this time a death blow. It has been planned by the chief of the general staff, Erich von Falkenhayn, a brilliant strategist with a cruel imagination. It is endorsed by the Kaiser. It will be executed by the Kaiser's own son, Crown Prince Friedrich Wilhelm, a sportsman turned general. To them, Falkenhayn has explained, there is ground so dear to France that to save it, she will throw in every man she has. Attack this objective, and France will be bled to death. The objective has been chosen. The plan is in motion. sector of the line, the Crown Prince installs an assault force, six divisions, 1,200 guns. Some 50,000 men are hidden deep in underground barracks close behind the front. There they will await the signal to launch the offensive, to lure the manpower of France into Falkenhayn's deadly trap. Beyond these trenches is ground that Frenchmen will die to save, if Falkenhayn is right. The objective lies in a jutting salient of the front. One small town, about 150 miles east of Paris. A place of no special military value, only the value that men's passions will give it. The objective is Verdun. Verdun on the River Meuse backwater of this war, a landmark of past wars. Under German siege in 1871, its citadel surrendered, opening the gates to French disaster in the Franco-Prussian War. More than a town, more than a fortress. It has become a kind of armed monument, a symbol of defeat waiting to be avenged. Its garrison of 20,000 troops, its 3,000 civilians, are hostages of their own history. Fort Douaumont is the most formidable of a ring of 20 forts that surround the town. Built after the defeat of 1871, they are massive and deep and hollow. Their turrets recently stripped of heavy guns, their underground vaults nearly emptied of manpower. Defense is scorned as unworthy and unnecessary. The French high command insists, you will not be attacked. These men have been so assured. Commandant Revillon and his staff photographed at their command post in Fort Douaumont. 
The time is February 1916. February 12th, the Germans are ready to attack, but a freezing snow intervenes. The French, now alerted to the danger, feverishly work on a new line of trenches outside the forts. And the German crown prince notes, the god of weather suddenly deranged our plans. We were deprived of our best ally, the factor of surprise. February 21st, skies clear, ground thawed. The Germans attack. these waves of men advancing behind a deluge of artillery, the French respond with what they have. The famous 75s. Accurate, fast firing, but light and unorganized. They are no match for the enemy's big guns. The French infantry, stunned in their trenches, have learned only one answer to an enemy attack. Counterattack. Ground is more precious than lives. They are met by a new, a frightful weapon, the flamethrower. Four days, the Germans overrun the trenches. They are scaling the approaches to the forts. On February 25th, Douaumont falls. Nearly abandoned altogether by a mix-up in orders, it is captured by a single German sergeant, followed by a handful of troops. Behind the spearhead, the Crown Prince arrives to deliver his congratulations in person. A new generation of German invaders has breached the defenses of Verdun. Only five miles beyond Fort Duomont, the town of Verdun is under bombardment by a huge naval gun made by Krupp and mounted on a railway carriage. The town is its special target. Before the fire lifts, nearly every building in the center of Verdun will be wrecked or badly damaged. Under pressure, Verdun panics. A frantic exodus gets underway. garrison command is crumbling. Troops have been shelled by their own guns. A whole division has disintegrated. The reserves are being chewed up. Whether Verdun can be held seems doubtful. To give up Verdun seems unthinkable. The issue is settled by an order from the French high command. Yield no more ground. A decision made for the slow-moving Joffre by the Vicomte de Castelnau, his second in command. Joffre sends in a new commander, General Henri Philippe Pétain. His orders to save Verdun. Cool and formal in manner, 
Pétain has the confidence of his troops, the grudging respect of his fellow generals.